Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's event, a lecture by Professor Bill Felice, which promises to be thought provoking, challenging, inspiring, as his talks always are. This is also a bittersweet event as it is Professor Felice's last public lecture before his retirement from the Eckerd faculty this coming May. It seems appropriate that tonight, introducing Professor Felice, who is an ardent believer in the power of a liberal arts education to teach us to understand and empathize with others, is the college's new president, Dr. Damian Fernandez. Like Professor Felice, a scholar of political science and international relations, and known for his commitment to equity and inclusion as key values of a liberal arts education. Please welcome President Fernandez. Thank you, Susan, and welcome everyone. This is really a love fest to celebrate Bill Felice, and it's an honor for me to introduce him. I want to begin my words quoting a former student. She said, one professor in particular sticks out in my mind as a humble hero whose passion and enthusiasm for life and education infuse his teaching with boundless energy, encourages his colleagues to aspire to higher levels of learning and teaching and inspire his students in ways admired by many and replicated by a few. Those words were quoted in a 2006 speech by the Honorable C.W. Bill Young of Florida to the House of Representatives on the occasion of Bill being named the 2006 Florida Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. The student who offered that quote was Taryn Fiedler, Fiedler, who I know well. She graduated from college, from Ecker College in 1999, later from Harvard Law School, and is now serving on our board of trustees. I know that many others would echo Taryn's remarks about her professor and mentor, Bill Felice. I could tell from the moment I met Bill that he was a person of deep compassion, wisdom, and enthusiasm. I came to learn that there is little at Eckerd that Bill has not touched and enhanced. Bill arrived at Eckerd in 1995 as an assistant professor of political science. In 2004, becoming the director of the Eckerd College Honors Program, and later the associate dean of general education. During 20, his 26 years at Eckerd, he has created the International Relations and Global Affairs Speaker Series and spearheaded the Plight and Promise of Africa, a year-long series that brought scholars of international renown to our college. He influenced many students throughout the uh, general education program and served, and served Eckerd on committees that have shaped us. He fostered relationships with international organizations in Geneva, The Hague, New York, and other places, and provided access through travel abroad to profound and life-changing experiences for countless students. And Bill published six books, nearly a hundred articles, academic papers and book reviews, and countless op-eds. I don't think he is a mortal presence on this earth. His awards for teaching and scholarship include the Grover Wren Leadership and Service to General Education Award in 2017, the Lloyd W. Chaping Award for Excellence in Scholarship and Art in 2011, the John M. Biven Award for Excellence and Campus Leadership Award in 2005, Professor of the Year in 2003, elected by the Ecuador student body, the Robert A. Staub Distinguished Teacher of the Year in 1999, and perhaps the most outstanding of all his achievements, 
the APSA Outstanding Teacher in Political Science in 1999. I cannot say it any better, so I'm borrowing from a faculty colleague who said of Bill, there are few who will ever leave or who have left an immense footprint and a community shaping impact on the college. Innovation, compassion, teaching, human rights, justice. Bill Felice lived at the heart of Eckerd College. Bill, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce you. Thank you for all you have done. Wow, thank you, uh, President Fernandez and uh, Dean Harrison for those very generous, um, kind, warm, and gracious uh, remarks uh, and, and introduction. I am really grateful and appreciative of both of your um, ongoing support of my teaching and, and my scholarship um, uh, here at Eckerd, Eckerd College. And thank you both also for your suggestion that I present this talk uh, tonight uh, to the Eckerd College uh, community um, and for your promotion of this uh, event as part of the presidential event series. I'm very grateful. Your, uh, both of your wonderful encouragement and backing over the years has helped me, helped me, helped make me, te helped teach me teaching at Eckerd College to be one of the highlights of my life. And I, I really thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, to facilitate uh, tonight's uh, program, um, I have recorded uh, my lecture, The Ethical Dimensions to International Relations and American Foreign Policy. Um, after uh, my brief introduction here to the evening, uh, we will broadcast the lecture. The lecture uh, takes about 50 minutes, 50 minutes, and this will be followed uh, by a live question and answer period, uh, host, uh, uh, moderated by my dear colleague and friend, uh, Tony Brunello, Professor Brunello, uh, for around 30 minutes or so. And so please, um, anytime during the evening you have a question, go ahead and post it um, in the chat uh, room, and Tony uh, Brunello will be monitoring that. And drawing up a list of questions to ask me um, after the lecture. You know, in teaching my classes um, at Eckerd College, um, I try to push uh, my students to think about and develop what I call their intellectual journeys. And uh, from day one, I talk about intellectual journeys. And I've tried to argue uh, the importance of integrating into one's personal intellectual uh, journey some of the key issues that we deal with in international relations and that we deal with in the in the liberal arts, issues of equity and justice, human rights, um, um, equality, freedom, and so on. And I think that grappling with these issues that are just listed on a personal level not only enriches one's personal purpose in life, uh, but it also makes us a better country, it makes us a better democracy, and we become better citizens, we're able to make better informed and thoughtful decisions um, in our democracy. And in my mind, that's exactly what a liberal arts education is about. And I think it is what Eckerd College excels, excels in. And that hopefully my classes, you know, have really pushed students to think about these issues, confront these issues, and perhaps uh, deepen their intellectual journeys accordingly. However, I did want to say, for me, it's been a two-way process. While I've challenged my students um, in these ways, my students have challenged me. Uh, they have pushed me on my intellectual uh, journey as much as I have, I have pushed them. And so to my former and present students here tonight, I want to say thank you, uh, that I am forever grateful uh, to you. Uh, as I've said, you've pushed me, you've challenged me, you've criticized me. Uh, when I was unclear, you really forced me to deepen my understandings and my perspectives. And being a teacher at Ecker College uh, has been one of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences of my life because of this interaction with, with the Ecker College students. So my intellectual journey has been fundamentally transformed, enhanced, and deepened through this 30-year colloquium, really, uh, with some of those wonderful young people in America, uh, which are Eckerd College students. And so my appreciation to you uh, really, really does run deep. The lecture you're about to see um, highlights uh, some of the key aspects of in the area of ethics and international relations that I've been teaching now for years and that have been deepened and informed uh, through this intellectual journey as a teacher. 
Some of the material you, uh, for my students uh, will be familiar to you. You've seen aspects of it in different classes. Uh, but this is the first time that I put this together in this manner, in this holistic manner. The architecture and final arguments um, in this presentation are totally new. And I hope that uh, the talk tonight is useful um, to you. So thank you uh, very much. Um, again, following the 50 minute lecture, there will be a question and answer period uh, with uh, moderated by Tony Brunello. And so I think we're ready to go. And so Cole, if you could please go ahead and play the recorded lecture. Hello, my name is William Felice. I'm a professor of political science um, here at Eckerd College. And it's my real pleasure to be with you uh, here today uh, to talk to you about this very difficult topic, the ethical dimensions to international relations in American uh, foreign policy. Now, you may be taken aback by the title. I mean, when most people think of international relations, they think of power politics, economic gain, war, and strife, and they don't think of ethics and morality. Uh, what I'm going to argue to you today is that, in fact, ethics and morality play a big role in international relations and foreign policy. And I'll make an argument further that it is of utmost importance uh, to resolving some of the major, major issues uh, confronting humanity um, in the uh, 21st century. Uh, so because of time, let's just jump right in. Uh, the way that I am going to approach this is uh, there are two parts, um, as you can see on the screen. Um, we are the overview of the presentation, which will is uh, part one. Uh, I'll, get, I'll discuss ethics, human rights, and universal values, and try to present sort of the historical evolution of these norms um, in international politics throughout, primarily um, focusing on the, the 20th century, but even going back a little before that. After we go through this historical overview of ethics and human rights, will part two then apply this framework to American foreign policy? And uh, with a focus on individual moral responsibility, what are, what are our, our moral duties, ethical duties in terms of foreign policy? And of course, what are the moral and ethical duties of, of our individuals in the foreign service, in the military, and of course, the president of the United States, him or herself? Uh, so that is where we're, we're headed. And uh, part one, then, is this overview of ethics, um, human rights, um, and universal uh, values. Uh, what I'm drawing on um, in this part are, is uh, from my book, uh, which is titled The Ethics of Interdependence, uh, Global Human Rights and, and Duties. Um, and so uh, what um, I argue in uh, this uh, uh, book and what I'm going to present today um, is that uh, human rights, international human rights, do represent a global ethic. So how do I make that argument? Well, let's start with uh, a couple quotes uh, from our former president, uh, Barack Obama, um, in July of 2008, as you can see. This is when he was running for uh, president. Um, he stood in front of an audience of over 200,000 um, in Berlin, and then Senator Barack Obama uh, said, uh, tonight I speak to you not as a candidate for president, but as a citizen, a proud citizen of the United States, and a fellow citizen of the world. Now, he followed up with, uh, with those ideas in two other speeches, uh, two real quick quotes here. Um, in 2009, in his speech in Egypt, uh, President Obama said, I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one based on mutual interest and mutual respect, one based upon the truth that America and Islam are not exclusive and need not be in competition, Instead, they overlap and share common principles, principles of justice and progress, tolerance and the dignity of all human beings. And finally, um, the third uh, quote here at the bottom, um, in November of uh, 2015, right after a, a horrendous um, terrorist attack in Paris, uh, the president said, once again, uh, we've seen an outrageous attempt to terrorize innocent civilians. This was an attack not just on Paris, it is an attack not just on the people of France, but this is an attack on all of humanity and the universal values uh, we share. So what do we have here in these quotes? Here we see the President of the United States, clearly a citizen of the United States, 
describing universal values. He describes himself as not only a citizen of the United States, but as a citizen of the world. And he, oh, he, he notes overlapping principles of justice, tolerance, and dignity uh, between Muslims and between the United States, between the United States and everyone around the world. What is President Obama, former President Obama, referring to? I think he's referring to a global ethic, an ethic embraced uh, by individuals and states with different politics, uh, different religions. And what I believe is that this new global ethic is based on international human rights norms and standards, international human rights norms and standards that have been adopted uh, by the global community uh, fundamentally since, since uh, World, War, uh, World War II. So I don't think it's nonsensical uh, to talk about ethics in international affairs. It's not an oxymoron uh, that, in fact, the world is filled with these values and, and the, uh, that they do impact on policy uh, and the direction of the international system. So there are three points of reference I would call your attention to. Uh, when you, and if you don't remember anything from today's lecture, <laughs> uh, remember these three dates. Because uh, these three dates really, uh, I think, uh, crystallize uh, the argument that I'm making around the importance of morality and ethics in, in, foreign, in foreign policy. So what are the three, the three dates? Number one, 1648, uh, the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, the Treaty of Westphalia, I think as some of you uh, know, um, ended the uh, Thirty Years' War in Europe in the 17th century, a horrendous war, a war of religion, a Protestant against Catholic. And many, Catholics, and in many respects, it was a war of human rights. You know, that I have the truth, and you are the infidel, and I will change the world through the sword and bring my view of morality uh, to be, uh, to be um, hegemonic in the international system. Well, what did this lead to? Um, it led to the level of violence the world had never seen. Historians talk about two-thirds of the population of Germany wiped out by this war and the diseases following the war. Uh, that the rivers with Germany are said to run red with blood as a result of this war. And so as a result of Westphalia, of the, of the Thirty Years' War, uh, the, the leaders of Europe got together um, in um, Westphalia um, and signed this peace treaty, uh, not because they suddenly liked the, the, other, the other side, uh, but, but they realized that to intervene in the name of human rights, to intervene in the name of their morality, caused more violence and destruction than otherwise. And therefore, what you had uh, from 1648 on to today uh, was sort of this privileging of state sovereignty, this privileging of national self-determination, this privileging of legal equality between states. And we can come back to this, but I just want to note here, since this is a talk on ethics, Note the ethical foundation to Westphalia. It wasn't just for power politics issues, uh, concerns. It really was to prevent more bloodshed, to prevent more suffering uh, between peoples. So 1648, flip ahead uh, many years uh, to 1919. 1919, you have, as you can see, uh, the establishment of the League of Nations in Geneva. And Woodrow Wilson, our former president, was key in, in the establishment, of, in, the, in the idea of the League of Nations, even though the United States never joined. Uh, but it really uh, pushed, they pushed at this time, uh, rights to self-determination and democracy. Well, what did this do? What this was, was really baby steps, you know, towards challenging Westphalia. That with Westphalia, the, the argument was the international community had no rights to intervene in what was going on inside nation states. Here you have baby steps in the sense that suddenly democracy and self-determination are seen as legitimate, legitimating principles to state sovereignty. Um, and in particular, democracy emerged as an important, um, an important uh, uh, component uh, to legitimate state sovereignty. And so uh, this was a break from the idea that no matter how states treated their citizens internally, that was not of concern to the international community. But I want to move quickly here, because the big break, of course, comes in 1945, after World War II, uh, with the establishment of the United Nations, and later in 1948, uh, the agreement on the Universal Declaration of, of Human, of human uh, Rights. Um, that this, uh, this uh, 
uh, was a product of, of what? It was a product of World War II, and in particular the genocide. Six million Jews killed, five million homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, gypsies. It goes on and on. They were killed, you know, in the indiscriminate murder of millions of people. And so technically what Hitler did in World War II because of Westphalia and it was not a violation of international law. And so the international community said, well, wait a minute, maybe we went too far here uh, with Westphalia, and we need to reconceptualize the norms and principles of the international system. And so never again emerges, never again will we allow states uh, to do, uh, treat their people the way Hitler uh, treated his people uh, in the years of World War, of World War II. Um, and so what we have today then is this balance, a balance between Westphalian principles on one hand and human rights principles on the other. They live in, in tension with each other um, as policy is decided at the national and global level. Well, before we go into then the content, well, what, what are these claims that are made uh, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the corpus of international human rights law before we get into that, we, maybe we should get clear on what we mean by a human right. You know, what is a human right? When we say uh, we, you know, we believe in human rights. Um, uh, just a small anecdote, I was fortunate enough to hear um, uh, uh, Barbara Jordan speak. Barbara Jordan was a former African American congresswoman uh, from Texas, I think one of the first, if not the first, African American woman elected to Congress and she had given two, uh, two addresses, uh, keynote addresses to two different Democratic conventions. And in Memphis, where I, t I taught at Rhodes College before coming to Eckerd College, um, uh, she was accepting a, a National Civil Rights Award um, at the National Civil Rights Museum, which is at the, at the Lorraine Hotel where Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And I was fortunate enough to hear her talk when she accepted that, that uh, award. And, uh, and part of her talk, she said she was, she at that point was a law professor at the University of Texas. And what she said, you know, she is, uh, she talks a lot about rights in her class with her students and, and she will like week three into the class turn to her law students and say, well, tell me what is a human right? And she'd be met with befuddlement and eyes glazed over and real difficulty of the students defining what a right was. Well, she went on in that talk uh, to define uh, what she believed was a human right. And what she said is this, I have it on the screen here, uh, human rights, that which is due you by tradition, law, or nature. Now, that's an interesting definition, that which is due you, you're entitled to it uh, by the tradition, law, or nature. Well, I thought about that definition, and I really wasn't satisfied with it. Um, that uh, really raises a lot of questions, right? Like, uh, uh, what tradition? What if the tradition is patriarchic or, or, or uh, homophobic? Um, uh, uh, what if a tradition had embraced slavery? You know, how do we, do we say that is the, where human rights come from? That represents human rights? I don't think so. Uh, law, law is determined often by elites in societies, uh, by those with money and power, not by uh, by people who's, who are suffering. And third, um, nature, you know, human nature, what is, are we empathetic, are we aggressive? You know, those debates could go on and they have gone on for hundreds of years in terms of what makes up uh, the human, human nature. So I wasn't satisfied with that definition and so the definition that I have in my work um, says this, that a human right is a claim on others to a certain type of treatment fundamentally linked to the alleviation of suffering. So it's a claim, it's a claim that we make linked to the alleviation of suffering. Now, the link to suffering is really important, right? I mean, we can make all sorts of claims. I could make a claim that I enjoy drinking fine wine every night uh, with dinner. I have a human right uh, to, uh, to wine. Well, that's not a legitimate human rights claim uh, because I'm not really suffering uh, without that, uh, that uh, product. Um, and so the link to suffering is really key uh, to defining what these claims are. Please also note that these human rights are social constructions. They are not like the Ten Commandments carved in stone that never change, uh, but rather they are product of our, 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 our social existence 
and new forms of, social, of suffering emerge uh, that then the human rights regime changes and enlarges itself to address those, those uh, types of, of suffering that have, have emerged. And so um, human rights, they're not like hands and ears and noses. You know, they are rather these, these constructions of legal and moral rules uh, that nations um, are, are to, to, nations and individuals are to, are to follow. And so the central purpose of human rights is to protect individuals and groups against arbitrary actions, not only of states, uh, but suffering caused by non-state actors as well, uh, global terrorist organizations, predator net multinational corporations, and so on. So what we have seen um, at, the, at the United Nations then, in terms of the process uh, to create these rights, uh, was an amazing global dialogue. It's probably the most amazing global um, uh, philosophical um, enriched workshop uh, that's ever taken place in human history. That Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, wife, uh, that she, uh, she led, she was the chair of the Human Rights uh, Commission, the first one in the 1940s at the United Nations. And she called in experts from around the world um, individuals representing liberalism, Christianity, Islam, Marxism, Buddhism, secular humanism, Confucianism, and a variety of other scholars. And for months they really debated, you know, what are these claims that are legitimate, that really would be universal, that all peoples everywhere uh, could uh, benefit from. And uh, this process, I think, is quite phenomenal, and it created the first document uh, was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I urge all of you to look up. It's on the web, really accessible, 30 short articles. And these are, uh, this was the first attempt, really, uh, to draft, you know, what the legitimate claims are that affect everyone, you know, from uh, New York to Sao Paulo uh, and so on around, around the world. Well, an easy way uh, to think about uh, these claims uh, is, is as follows. Um, uh, you can, here you can see the evolution of these, uh, these human rights claims. Uh, that we have um, uh, three, I used to call it, say, generations, uh, using Carl Vasek's term, he's UNESCO's legal advisor, but generations, I think, is problematic. I think it's better to see these as three pillars. They stand equal to each other, and they're all interdependent on each other. And so these three pillars of, uh, of human rights are First of all, civil and political rights. And these we in the West are most familiar with. Uh, we, uh, uh, fr they're from the American Revolution and the French uh, Revolution. And they are, are revolve around the, the norm of liberty and freedom. And so these, of course, are rights to life, liberty, security, freedom from torture, inhumane and degrading treatment, freedom from arbitrary arrest, right to a pub fair and public trial, and so on. I could keep reading the list, but I think you're familiar with them. That's pillar number one. Pillar number two are economic, social, and cultural rights, and they arose from the Bolshevik Revolution in the uh, former Soviet Union, social democracy in Europe, and they represent um, these economic, social, and cultural, cultural rights represent the norm of equality. So we have liberty, equality, and, and these are rights to work, rights to social security, protection against unemployment, uh, a standard of living adequate for the health, well-being of yourself and your family, the right to an education, and so on. And finally, the third generation of rights are called solidarity rights, and they come not from a revolution like the American Revolution, uh, but they're a result of the situation in the world we find ourselves in in the 21st century of complex interdependence, that we are reliant on each other around the world, we in the America, you can't solve global warming without working in fraternity with Brazil and fraternity with China and solidarity with India and so on. And so these are called um, uh, solidarity rights and the principle is fraternity, uh, that they are based on the right to a healthy and balanced environment, the right to peace, the right to humanitarian disaster relief, um, and the right to benefit from what's called the common heritage of humankind are an example of, of solidarity rights. 
So an easy way to remember this is the slogan of the French Revolution, Liberté, Equalité, Fraternité. Uh, liberty, Equality, Fraternity uh, represent the three um, uh, uh, areas of human rights that have evolved in the 21st century. So I'm highlighting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, but keep in mind that a whole corpus of international law, human rights law, backs up that document now. There's the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, on Women, Minorities, on Refugees, Migrants, Children, Against Apartheid, Against Torture, Against Genocide. And so in the, uh, I think at this moment in the 21st century, uh, we have quite a, a, a creation by the United Nations of norms uh, to guide state behavior um, in, their, in their foreign policy. And the universal, universalism of this, these norms is based that these are rights that everyone deserves, everyone is equal, everyone is equal in particular in human dignity. So in the 20th century, I think that we all can agree uh, it is ripe with examples of the denial of such rights to Jews, to blacks, to indigenous peoples, to women, to gays, to transsexuals, and so on. And so the universality of human rights is really based on a claim that we can do better than that. We can move beyond that in the 21st century um, so that everyone, everyone's humanity um, can, be, can be protected. So this is... Um, the, uh, uh, the background in terms of why I make the argument that human rights represent a global ethic uh, that can guide foreign policy and have guided foreign policy and have guided international relations. Um, a final uh, point uh, to make here in part one is then, so we have the, the, the human rights drafted in the documents I've described, um, but what does that mean in terms of duties? And so what, uh, what I believe is there are duties on three levels. Uh, the individual level, that we all have duties to know what these rights are, to respect these in other people, um, and to fight for them. Awareness and action um, is what I put on the screen. At the nation state level, uh, there are negative and positive duties. Uh, um, sometimes not to act, um, and other times to act, as we'll, as we'll be talking about in just a moment, uh, to uphold these rights. And finally, at the global level, International organizations, multinational corporations, and non-governmental organizations also have duties uh, to uphold uh, these, these rights. Okay, so that um, takes us through part one, sort of the drafting of, of the, uh, the human rights uh, framework. Has a global framework, a global ethical framework to guide foreign policy. I'd like to move to part two in applying these ethics to American foreign policy. And in this um, case, I'm drawing on my book, uh, How Do I Say My Honor? War, Moral Integrity, and Principle uh, Resignation. Uh, just as an example, uh, then, of how, how we can think about the application of ethics and these three levels of duties, um, individual, nation, state, and international relations to, to, uh, to areas of American foreign policy. So, um, I'd like to use as the first example uh, the war in Iraq in 2003 and talk about that. Um, and we will eventually get up to the Trump administration uh, where a lot of these issues I think are quite prescient uh, for today. Uh, but let's go back a little bit in time um, and talk about, uh, about uh, the Iraq war in 2003. I know you students uh, who are watching this uh, are very, were very young. Uh, in 2003, and it's not wasn't a formative experience probably uh, in your um, uh, in your life at this point. Um, but um, let's just uh, uh, go back in time for a bit, and uh, and uh, an amazing thing happened um, in 2002, in the beginning of 2003. The war actually breaks out in March of 2003, and in 2002. Um, uh, there was organizing around the world to try to stop this war from happening. Uh, then in every major city in the world, hundreds of thousands of people uh, were organizing, millions of people pleading with the United States not to invade Iraq. Now, in the United States, the atmosphere was very different. We were reeling from 2001 and 
and the Bush administration had tried to link Saddam Hussein to Al-Qaeda, and so if you were opposed to the war, you, know, you were considered a traitor. And the vast majority of the American people supported the war in 2002 and 2003. Um, and so uh, during this time, uh, the organizers against the war, trying to stop it before it happened, uh, picked a day um, in, in February of uh, 2003. Um, and uh, they then um, said, this is the day we will, we will protest. And so, um, and uh, you should look it up. I mean, literally millions of people uh, from Asia, Latin America, Africa, Europe, the United States, uh, were trying to get this war stopped. Well, students at Eckerd College uh, wanted to be part of this, and so they organized a small demonstration here at our campus, and uh, they asked me to speak at it. And so I gave a lot of thoughts about uh, what I was going to say and, and took it pretty seriously. And uh, there are a few hundred people, it's actually pretty good for Eckerd, um, uh, uh, maybe 500 people came. Uh, and our library was being built at that time, a new library, and so there's a lot of construction workers, um, who like 50 construction workers that were watching the rally as well. Uh, so I gave my talk as to why I was opposed to the war, and uh, again, I thought it went well, got interviewed by the media, and then went back to my office. Um, and when I got to my office, um, turned on my answer machine, and there was a death threat. And so uh, there was a man, it was clearly not a student, it was, the voice was a, an adult. And the man said that I was a traitor, that I was a supporter of Al Qaeda, and that uh, I was uh, abusing my position, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, position um, to poison these students' minds, and that he wanted to uh, put a rope around my neck and hang me in downtown St. Petersburg. Well, needless to say, this was quite, uh, quite disturbing, and we took some measures at Eckerd College, just monitoring uh, to make sure that uh, nothing serious was going to happen. All this Florida, so you have to be prepared <laughs> uh, for crazy things happening. Uh, but luckily, nothing did happen. Uh, but uh, uh, that incident, um, and, and 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 I think it was part of a a, a time. Uh, when it was really hard to speak out against the war. By 2006, it was easy to speak out against the war. By then, things had gone south. Body count was rising. Uh, mission accomplished fiasco had happened. And, uh, and so everyone, not everyone, but the majority of people in America were against the war. In 2002, 2003, polls ranged from 60 to 80 percent of the American people, some said that as high as 90, supported the war. And you had the, Ameri the uh, president's press secretary, Ari Flesher, saying to the American people, watch what you say and watch what you do. Like, shut them up. Uh, you had, you had con con uh, commencement speakers booed off the stage uh, when they dared to criticize uh, President Bush. Uh, you had uh, the Dixie Chicks, this, uh, this uh, musical group, um, ha had the temerity to criticize the president, said they didn't support the war. And they were banned on radio stations across the South. Their, their, their CDs were broken and burnt. And to be Dixie Chicked became a verb, which means you suddenly were attacked in the way they were, they were attacked. And so the death threat I received was part of that whole time period when it's very hard to speak out against the war. But uh, this incident did cause me to think, you know, well, wait a minute. Does this man who made this death threat to me, is there some truth in what he's saying? Was I abusing my position of authority, authority uh, as a professor? Uh, not that I can control my students, uh, but should I, um, uh, am I, you know, because I do have a certain position, you know, do I have a right to speak out um, in this way uh, about a position in foreign policy that I felt very strongly about? that it was, a, it was a, a mistake. And so I'm really mulling over, you know, what is the moral responsibility in terms of the duties that we talked about at the individual level of a professor in political science at a time of, in a time of war. So um, during this time, um, I was uh, mulling this over and I read uh, uh, this very eloquent le letter, and I won't read it to you uh, because of time, but it is reproduced um, in my book. Uh, from uh, Brady Kiesling, 
And Brady Kiesling became the first um, uh, State Department Foreign Service officer to, re to resign over the war in Iraq. Um, and he, uh, he resigned and he wrote this eloquent le letter and he, and he said you know, he, his moral duty led him, even though he had trained for his life uh, to serve in the Foreign Service, he was stationed in Greece, he was giving up his pension, he was giving up his financial security, uh, but he couldn't continue uh, to keep going to the Greek government and say, you've got to support us in this endeavor. You know, this is in the interests of, of the United States and the world when he thought it really not only wasn't, uh, but it really damaged the United States and damaged the world. And so he resigned. And so I thought, wow, you know, here's, you know, I, what did I risk? Nothing. Uh, speaking out, here's a man who risked everything uh, to, to live to his moral, to moral uh, up to his moral ideals, you know, at the individual level there. He, he t accepted responsibility and everything that followed. So that, caught, that was the impetus for that, that book, How Do I Say My Honor? So I went and then I interviewed um, uh, the other people in the State Department who resigned, which was only Anne Wright and John Brown. There were only three uh, during that whole period. I interviewed soldiers, Aaron Watada um, and um, uh, Aidan Delgado, um, these brave young boys who um, just couldn't uh, continue to fight um, in Iraq. They would fight in Afghanistan, but they couldn't do it uh, because they didn't think it was a just war. Um, I expanded and talked to individuals inside the Foreign Service who did not resign, uh, but, but opposed the war and tried to change things from within. Um, and uh, I was trying to figure out well, what, you know, re resignation, not resignation. The point was not to lose your voice and to be able to speak and, and to try to impact uh, policy. Um, I then interviewed people in Britain, in the Blair government, uh, where many more resigned uh, over differences with Blair um, over the war in Iraq. And this talk today is not Iraq um, in detail, um, uh, but I, there's two, a couple things I would say. Uh, and then draw some broader lessons. One thing that was interesting to me in the interviews that I conducted uh, was that the normative framework of these individuals who took these issues seriously varied a lot. Some were Christians, um, some were Buddhists, uh, some were uh, human rights oriented, some were political realists, some were focused on international law, um, and some were Muslims. They came from a variety of different foundational principles, but they all ended up in the same place. And um, their main reasons why this was such an egregious um, war revolved around two big things, uh, jus in bello and jus ad bellum, the justice in going to war and the justice in fighting the war. And they, in terms of the principles of just war theory that go back to St. Augustine, that in both areas, uh, the United States, they found a lacking in terms of the justification for going to war. Um, when George Tenet announced that there was no imminent threat to the United States from Saddam Hussein and no imminent threat to Saddam Hussein's neighbors um, in the Middle East, then they said, if that's the case, and they're just quoting the CIA director, this is a war of aggression and not a war of, of uh, preemption or self-defense. And second, in terms of Jus and Bello, uh, they really believe uh, that torture is jus cogens in international law. Um, it is never to be violated. And the re continued reports of the United States uh, humiliating, degrading prisoners, the arbitrary arrests, um, the cruel and inhumane uh, uh, humane treatment was, uh, uh, was beyond the pale. And so because of these two broad areas, uh, these, individuals, um, these individuals resigned. So, why didn't Moore resign? What's interesting about this study was that when Anne Wright resigned, she had spent 30 years in the military and then 20 years in the Foreign Service, and then she, you know, this was just too much. She resigned. When she resigned, she got over 400 emails and letters from others in the Foreign Service said, Anne, I respect what you did. I wished I had the courage. I wished I could speak out, but I can't. You know, I have to keep my job, you know, I, I just can't risk it. The, 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 the repercussions would be too great. Think about if 400 people had resigned um, in the build up to the war. I, I think it would perhaps have made a difference. Um, 
But uh, um, what, uh, uh, again, we don't have time to get into the details of Iraq, but I did want to draw out uh, uh, for you just three broad lessons that I think have, have, um, have implications beyond, beyond Iraq. And in terms of the ethics and foreign policy and, and, and overall and, and what the dangers often are. The first is the danger of loyalty becoming a vice instead of a virtue. You know, what I found in terms of why other people didn't speak out or didn't resign is that in the American political system anyway, and also in Britain, Loyalty becomes the primary virtue. You're loyal to the president. You're loyal to the administration. He was elected. It's only been a he, unfortunately, so far. He was elected uh, president and not me. And so my job is simply to be the, uh, the good soldier and carry out, carry out the orders. And that this has had disastrous consequences. Um, and uh, we saw it, uh, as I mentioned, the former people in the Foreign Service who supported Dan Wright but couldn't speak out. Uh, we saw it in the Pentagon uh, where the people looked at Rumsfeld's hastily driven up, uh, drawn up war plans and thought they were um, poorly planned, but they, they were afraid to uh, speak out. And we saw it you know, at Eckerd College and around the country where citizens knew this didn't seem right. They couldn't quite get the connection to Al-Qaeda. Uh, it wasn't there. There was nothing to get. Uh, but they didn't speak out either um, against, against the war. And so I'm not arguing loyalty is not important. We don't want disloyal people in the government. Uh, uh, but loyalty has to be balanced with other equally important norms, including honesty, critical thinking, and most importantly, maintaining one's own voice and one's own uh, moral autonomy. Um, second, uh, the danger of ignoring the ethical dimensions uh, to foreign policy. Um, you know, one person I tried to interview that was Colin Powell. He was Secretary of State uh, with George uh, W. Bush. And he ended up, as I think you all know, giving that very famous speech at the United Nations in support of the war in Iraq, uh, which he now describes as a black stain on his record. Uh, but uh, so I tried to interview him, and I wrote him a letter uh, you know, asking, and I went through all of my connections. I don't have many connections, but the connections I had to try to get to him. And uh, he actually took the request pretty seriously, but he didn't agree to the interview. Uh, but what he did is he wrote me a letter. And you know, he's a pretty busy man. All he had to say was, I'm busy. <laughs> and I would have understood. Uh, but he, I think, was jolted by my framing of the questions. And so in this letter, which is also reproduced in my book, um, he, uh, he, he describes the war in Iraq, and I'm quoting here. He says, this was a policy dispute not an ethical dispute. This was a policy dispute, not an ethical dispute. And so what he, this was stunning uh, because he was basically arguing in this letter uh, that the moral responsibility lied with the president. The president was elected by the people. He weighed all sides of the argument, decided on the direction to go, and his job was implement, his, Colin Powell's job was implementing the policy. Um, and so for him, he had no moral responsibility. I find that stunning because Colin Powell is simply saying here he's following orders. Um, and in fact, um, uh, I can think of no bigger ethical decision than the decision to intentionally kill in warfare. Um, if there's any uh, ethical decision uh, of substance, I think warfare and engaging in warfare is definitely an ethical dispute, uh, not a policy dispute. Uh, but public officials, moving on from uh, Iraq, public officials um, separate ethics from policy making all the time. And part of my point today is that this has led to disastrous uh, policies. Um, Henry Kissinger, in a taped conversation with Nixon in 1973, brutally, was brutally dismissive of requests for the United States to pressure the Soviet Union to permit Jews to immigrate and escape persecution. And I quote Mr. Kissinger, he said, the immigration of Jews from the Soviet Union is not an, object, an, an objective of American foreign policy. And if they put Jews into a gas chamber in the Soviet Union, it is not an American concern. And then he went on to say, maybe a humanitarian concern. He later, um, Mr. Kissinger said his, that quote was taken out of context, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, what is the quote really saying? What it's saying is, look, we have a national interest defined in terms of power. 
politics, sort of a realist, the real politique conception of, of, uh, of, uh, of foreign policy, and ethics are a secondary concern. So putting Jews in a gas chamber may be a humanitarian concern, but it's not a primary concern of American foreign policy. Um, and this sort of approach of real politique, of realist politics, I think has led to disastrous decision making in American foreign policy. For example, Lawrence Eagleburger, uh, when he was uh, Secretary of State with George Herbert Walker Bush, where 200,000 people were being murdered in Bosnia, he said, you know, unfortunately that genocide is just not a priority for the United States. If the Soviet Union, if the Cold War was still going on, and the Soviet Union was involved in the former Yugoslavia, we would be in there to confront them, to stop the genocide. But they're not, so it, genocide's not a priority. Or Bill Clinton uh, in Rwanda. Uh, Bill Clinton danced around the genocide. We, it was a small show of force so that could have saved a million people, possibly. Uh, but instead, he didn't want to say it was genocide, and so he had his spokespeople talk about acts of genocide, as if uh, then, therefore, if it's only acts of genocide and not genocide, this wordplay is disgusting, uh, then uh, the United States would not have to act. Or President Obama, you know, with the drone warfare in the Middle East and Yemen and the, th the hundreds of civilians that were killed, he, he like refused to look at it, you know, because American soldiers weren't getting killed. Um, and so uh, this was, I think, an abnegation of the ethical dimension of uh, foreign policy as well. And of course, we're going to get to Trump um, in a minute, but um, his racism, white supremacy, incitement of insurrection, mishandling of the pandemic, I mean, the list goes on and on um, in terms of the ethical dimension uh, being missing in the decision making of the, of the uh, Trump administration. So finally then, um, what I hope all this shows to you is the importance of individual um, moral autonomy. All of us have a responsibility uh, to engage in ethical reasoning and decide for ourselves to protect our moral autonomy, to establish a line at which we say, not in my name. Um, and that is the challenge, I think, uh, for us at the individual level. It is too easy for us to say, you know, well, that's the president's problem, or that's, you know, uh, at Eckerd College, Damian Fernandez's problem, the president of Eckerd College, or, or, the, uh, you know, or that's the professor's problem and not the student's problem. We can, it, there's many ways we can absolve ourselves and, uh, and uh, not act, but I think we need to reclaim our individual moral economy. Autonomy, it's essential in a democracy uh, to check on abuses of uh, power um, by, by, the, uh, by the government. Well, that leads us uh, to, uh, I keep saying we're gonna get to the Trump administration. <laughs> uh, and so that leads us to this last uh, uh, part here. So I don't want to talk uh, too much, uh, too much uh, longer. Um, but this will focus on, you know, the, on um, government um, uh, officers, government officials, foreign service officers, uh, people who, who, um, who work for the government and, uh, and are defenders of the Constitution. I mean, individuals in government uh, take an oath to defend the Constitution and carry out that task in their individual capacities. The oath is to defend the Constitution and not to defend a particular uh, president. And uh, I think that it, it's hard to do that uh, for the reasons of loyalty, being primary that I talked about earlier. Uh, but one um, scholar, Max Weber, the famous sociologist, I think he's very helpful in really crystallizing what the conflict is. And he describes it as the conflict between ethic of conviction uh, versus an ethic of responsibility. So the ethic of conviction is to act on your principles and beliefs. You know, what you believe, you murder is wrong, the war in Iraq was wrong, or the actions of these administrations that I just listed were wrong, and you know, your responsibility to act on that. The ethic of responsibility, on the other hand, is tied to your function in the government, one's duty, and one's loyalty to the administration. Now Weber insisted this could, uh, these two could be brought together and produce moral character and right action, uh, producing a human being who, as he wrote, is capable of having a vocation of, for politics. But it's tricky, isn't it? You know, when a government employee um, uh, 
how is a government employee to act uh, to bring these two sides together when the White House veers in a direction that compromises your deepest moral conviction? Which becomes more important, the ethic of conviction or that of responsibility? How do you save your honor when you're working in a, in, when um, uh, the fundamental conceptions of human dignity, decency, and democracy seem to be challenged uh, by, uh, by the government? You know, part of the problem with leaving and resigning is you say, well, if I resign, then the bad guys will win and they'll just bring somebody in worse than, worse than me. Hannah Arendt, in her writing, uh, says, well, you're deluding yourself if you think by staying in, you're slowing things down. Um, she said, uh, she warned us against the lesser evils and this, against supporting a bankrupt administration. So I have great admiration for the diplomats during Trump's first uh, impeachment, William Taylor, Marie Yovanovitch, who had to overcome serious impediments uh, before testifying in that impeachment um, hearing. And their testimony uh, is no longer really loyal to the man, but they're loyal to the Constitution. And it brought the wrath of the president, right? Uh, president Trump called them human scum. Uh, now, what it, why he did that it was pretty clear. He wanted to warn other people not to speak out. Uh, there were likely dozens of others in government who had wanted to speak out about issues of morality and illegality in the policies of the Trump administration. Yet they didn't speak out, just as the 400 people didn't speak out when Anne Wright resigned over Iraq. They didn't speak out when, uh, during that impeachment uh, process. They remained silent. And you can understand why, right? Uh, you know, put yourself in their shoes. You know, individuals in the State Department, in this case, since that's what we're talking about, the Foreign Service, they want to get ahead, right? They want their careers to advance. Well, speaking out and raising disagreements with the presidency is certainly no career path for promotion. Uh, second, I think most of us feel that our primary ethical duty is to ourselves and our families, our immediate community, um, and not to the government and, and, and uh, uh, issues that are far from us personally. Third, there's, there's difficult uh, issues of inadequacy. Who am I uh, to question these actions? Um, uh, who am I to stand up when the experts uh, in the Justice Department and elsewhere seem to be agreeing with what's going on? And finally, the fourth I've already covered, uh, this issue of loyalty. Um, loyalty to the president seems to be, um, seems to be over overriding all other concerns. So I applaud um, William Taylor, Maria Jovanovic, and others um, who, who, did, who did speak out. And what we have seen in the last month, or last two months, as, uh, as the insurgency happened in Washington, D.C., and the attempt to uh, stop uh, the election uh, from moving, uh, Joe Biden from moving forward, uh, what you did see then were dozens and dozens of other Trump officials uh, finally and one could argue, uh, speaking out. And I want to end just by highlighting uh, three of them um, who did uh, speak out. And I think they crystallized then the importance uh, that I hope uh, has become clear today of, of, of ethics and morality um, in, in, in how we conduct our lives. The first woman, her name is Erica Newland. Uh, she worked in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department from 2016 to 2019. And she wrote the following. Uh, she said, I'm haunted by what I did. The trade-off wasn't worth it. And giving voice to those trying to destroy the rule of law and dignifying their efforts with our talents and even our basic competence, we enabled that destruction. Were we doing enough good elsewhere to counterbalance the harm we facilitated, the way a public health official might accommodate a president on the margins to push forward a vaccine development? No. No matter our intentions, we were complicit. We collectively perpetuated an anti-democratic leader by conforming to his assault on reality. We may have been victims of the system, but we were also its instruments. No matter how much any one of us pushed back from within, we did so as members of a professional class of government lawyers who enabled an assault on our democracy, an assault that nearly ended it. To remind future government lawyers that when asked to undermine our democracy, the right course is to refuse and hold your peers to the same standard. Or Philip Halperin, assistant US attorney for 36 years in the Justice Department, wrote, I won't work for Attorney General William Barr's Justice Department anymore. 
The Justice Department is parroting the president's wild and unsupported conspiracy theories regarding mail-in ballots as retaliatory actions against those who pursue legal persecutions. The last straw for him uh, was using tear gas in Lafayette Park to quell peaceful protesters. And finally, Chuck Park, a U.S. Foreign Service officer focuses on trade with decades of experience, resigned over President Trump's toxic agenda. And he wrote the following, I'm ashamed of how long it took me to make this decision. My excuse might be disappointing, be familiar to many of my colleagues. I let career perks silence my conscience. I let free housing, the countdown to a pension, and the prestige of representing a powerful nation overseas distract me from ideals that once seemed so clear to me. I can't do that, uh, do that um, any, anymore. So what this is saying to me, it overlaps with what Václav Havel, the famous dissident in the former Czechoslovakia and the former president then of the Czech, Czech Republic uh, before he died. Um, he wrote the following. He said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. You act because it is the right thing to do. And he called it living in truth. And so I call on all of us and all individuals in the Foreign Service and the US government to live in truth, to maintain our personal integrity, and to act ethically um, to, to our own personal moral convictions while carrying out the government's orders. When the two conflict, more often than not, one's personal moral convictions uh, should carry the day and uh, should carry the day. And so there's tremendous pressure to loyally support the government, and that must be balanced with other virtues, including maintaining your own voice and your own moral, uh, moral autonomy. This is not the deep state trying to advance its agenda, but rather it is a patriotic defense of the public good. Such a moral sensibility will make us not only a better people, but a more powerful nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I have so many questions to, to pose to you that I'm not going to make any uh, gratuitous remarks on my part tonight. Uh, they want to, they want to ask you questions. Are you ready? Uh, sure. I'm absolutely ready. I'm not okay. sure the answer, but I'll do the best I can. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and, and uh, I know we said students should come first, but I, one of the earliest questions is one I think you'll find very interesting. It comes from a colleague, so I'm going to pose it to you right away. Um, and it's from Margie, and she wants to know if there's a universal right to self-defense, and is that a slippery slope toward the right to bear arms? And when does our right to self-protection become less important than our right for protection from others? So what do you think about the right to a universal right to your own self-defense? Um. I, I would, uh, um, uh, you know, self-defense in international relations, and I'm not sure the way Margie is thinking about it, but it's self-defense in terms of uh, the state, uh, that nations have the right to defend themselves uh, from aggression or attacks uh, of, of, of uh, other states or non-state actors, terrorist groups, um, that this is, uh, this is seen as, as a right. Um, in the human rights literature, I think um, Henry Hsu uh, talks about uh, uh, three different legs, really, of, of, of uh, rights, uh, security, freedom, and subsistence, uh, that all of us have, have rights to uh, security, the security of our personal being, and nations have rights to, to their security. Freedom, we, we are free of uh, oppression, oppression of aristocratic, autocratic governments and dictatorships and rights to subsistence, economic and social uh, human rights. Um, and so I think that that sort of corresponds to the three pillars of human rights that I laid out, laid out uh, before of liberty, equality, fraternity. Um, and so um, self-defense from uh, violent attacks, um, I think is, uh, is part of the way uh, rights are, 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 is part of the corpus of human rights. If you look at, um, at the International um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, I think that defense is seen as, as a right a right there as, as well. I, I would note also it's a defense uh, of the United States or Department of Defense, military spending. Um, it, it may be out of control in terms of the um, $700 billion we're spending, 
but defense overall is considered to be a public good uh, that we all benefit uh, from this security uh, that, that, that that provides. Uh, so hopefully, Margie, that, that answers at least a little of your question. Thank you, Bill. I'm just going to have to uh, just kind of bend your ear before you leave. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'll go right to the next one. And it's in an interesting one. Sarah Face, can you apply your analysis to private actors like fossil fuel companies? How would you apply your arguments to, to say, I'm going to add this to it, ExxonMobil and other uh, uh, significant uh, companies such as these? Well, you know, one of the interesting um, developments in, in human rights in the last uh, 30 years is that it doesn't just apply to states, um, that state and non-state actors are accountable uh, for, uh, for suffering that they, that they cause. And there is, um, in, again, in the, it's, it's still soft law at this point, there's not hard law, uh, but there is a right to a healthy environment uh, that the United Nations has, has affirmed. Um, and uh, within that, uh, in some nations, such as South Africa, have incorporated uh, these principles into their, their state and national constitutions. Um, and so um, uh, within that framework, it's possible to hold Exxon or other fossil fuel companies accountable. You know, in international law, the, um, the way it works is that, is that international law is enforced through nations. And there's a lot of everyone who claims, you know, there's no enforcement mechanisms, there's no way for, there's no world police force. And, and so people get away with breaking international laws and all the time. Nations do, terrorist groups do, and so on. All that is true. Uh, but the, to be clear in terms of your question, uh, the entity responsible to hold Exxon accountable for uh, cutting back on, on polluting the environment or, or oil spills or other actions um, uh, that have, and negatively affect their labor force, that, that it, the, the, the entity responsible to hold them accountable is the nation. And so if Exxon is, is operating in Nigeria and Nigeria has signed uh, these human rights accords, Nigeria can't say, well, it's not my responsibility, it's this multinational corporation, look at what they're doing. Uh, what the United Nations says is no, Nigeria, now you have to hold Exxon accountable uh, to uphold their environment, to, to uphold their national environmental law, or the United States does, or China does. And so they, the states can't just push it off and say, I have no responsibility here. No, I'm not Exxon, uh, they're independent actors. Um, and actually, if you study international law, uh, this gives it its strength uh, because across the board, um, if you hold states accountable, and NGOs have been brilliant at, uh, at organizing ways in which uh, to hold their states accountable, uh, to follow through on their word. Uh, so that when they sign these treaties, uh, they can't just uh, then be hypocritical or ignore uh, their responsibilities. So I hope that, uh, that answers the question. Well, there were some that were earlier, I'm gonna hold uh, back because they're, they're more general. Uh, there's a couple really good ones. Um, Donna Oglesby asked uh, a question I think you might want to look at. It. She says that a priority in Biden's foreign policy uh, is democracy renewal at home. And when we recognize that uh, one of our two political parties is anti-democratic, now according to national security strategy, does the water's edge have any meaning in foreign policy today? <laughs> um, I'm not sure it does. I think that's that's a very good, uh, very good question. Um, you know, democracy renewal, I think, in the United States does uh, begin at home. I think uh, our democracy is, is, at, um, is threatened uh, for the many since um, January 6th. I think that's been clear uh, to all of us. Um, uh, but I do think that one of the things that we've seen uh, since um, the George Floyd murder um, is a renewal of, of uh, the democratic movements in America. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has, has, has bloomed in a way, there's an acceptance of, of Black Lives Matter um, in, this, in um, national sports, in campuses across country, the, 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 the process of renewing democracy, um, which got sidetracked by January 6th, should not be, be forgotten. Um, and if you link that to Amendment 4 uh, in, in, um, in uh, Florida, uh, the great uh, uh, movement to, to, 
to deal with the greatest human rights crisis in America, in America today, which is the mass incarceration of, of African American of African Americans. Um, um, when you see the way citizens took that on, um, and really, and of course, we haven't achieved victory yet. Uh, but I think a turning point has happened in many of these areas where democracy is actually being renewed in America. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, in my my book, The Ethics of Interdependence, I begin uh, with chapter one on the United States. Um, it's not just um, human rights. You know, many people, when they think of human rights, they think of, you know, they think of China or they think of, of Russia. And, and that is correct. We should do that. But, you know, our struggle does begin at home. And so we need to come into compliance with the universal, um, with the Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which we have signed. Uh, we need to be in compliance with the Convention Against Torture, which we have signed and we have violated. Um, and so uh, this struggle for human rights, I think, uh, very much, uh, and for democracy, uh, the, the first pillar, uh, really, of the three pillars I outlined of, uh, of ethics and international affairs um, and human rights, uh, the first pillar really does, the struggle for that begins at home. This question kind of, I'm going to jump into this question because it kind of relates to how you just answered that, Bill, and it asks you to reflect upon the way you see the world today and, and the future. And it wants to know, uh, this is Blanca Catalina, what is the biggest difference you see uh, for the newest generation of activists? Are there more challenges or advantages? Do you see challenges in human rights today? Or what are the major challenges in human rights today? Yeah, I think that's related to the answer I just gave. You know, the big uh, the uh, the difference in activism uh, today um, is uh, is is pretty profound. I see students really mobilized around Black Lives Matter. I see students really mobilized around environmental rights. Um, I think uh, uh, students are really mobilized around um, issues of LGBTQ rights, um, and that these violations are massive in the United States. Um, and that this type of activism makes, makes a difference. And it's linked to, you know, this is, you know, uh, international relations talk, you know, and I, I think it's, it's what, what happens here has ramifications abroad. Uh, the LGBTQ movement here has really worked in conjunction, for example, uh, with the gay rights movements um, in Africa. Um, and so groups like SMUG, uh, sexual minorities in Uganda, have gained support from uh, the work that's done by human rights activists in America. And there's this, this symbiotic uh, relationship, uh, almost similar to what happened uh, with the ANC and the struggle against apartheid. I mean, you see this in, in different issues like, like the environment, uh, like LGBTQ uh, rights, uh, that, that gives me great hope for the future, um, actually. And so, um, you know, I think after January 6th, we all got pretty depressed about the state of the world and the state of our country, uh, but we shouldn't keep lose track of, of the, these hopeful um, uh, historical uh, patterns of human rights uh, uh, progress uh, that I think have been made in the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. There's a couple of questions that are sort of uh, related, but they sound very different. I'm going to start with the one that comes a little later. It's from Saren Fitzpatrick, and he wants to know if there's such a thing as an altruistic foreign policy, Professor Felice. Is there such a thing as an altruistic foreign policy? Um, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, no foreign policy is going to be probably pure. Um, there's always a... Uh, a self-interest, but I guess I guess in a way I would say there could be uh, because if you define your foreign policy, if you redefine uh, the national uh, the national interest, you know uh, Morgenthau always said the national interest is defined in terms of power, you know, and it's a, you know power equals the national interest. Well, what is power? Well, power um, to political realists is military power, economic power uh, primarily. Well, if you redefine power um, uh, to uh, to be um, uh, to be to, to, to focus on, on human development um, and human rights, um, then I perhaps you could have an altruistic uh, foreign policy. I think this, the Scandinavian countries have done that um, and they actually uh, uh, box way above their weight level. 
I mean, they, they carry enormous uh, prestige in the international system uh, because they're not hypocritical about human rights, because they take all three generations of human rights seriously. Uh, they enact them domestically and internationally. Um, and I think uh, that is uh, something the United States can do. We always think it would weaken our position you know, if we don't focus on hard power resources. I think it would enhance our position if we became more altruistic, uh, uh, to use that term. Um, if human rights became what we practice and not, not what, what we preach only, uh, that if we weren't hypocritical, we'd be a country that nations would want to follow, uh, not a nation that nation that people had to follow because we had the gun at their, at their, at their head. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk these days about a feminist foreign policy and, and in New Zealand, I think we've seen the successful success of that um, and that different uh, uh, female leaders have, have uh, embraced this sort of approach to human development in their foreign policy. That's been successful. And so in a way, I think uh, the answer to that question is yes, uh, that there can be an altruistic foreign policy, more feminist oriented, more developed, uh, more focused on human development and human rights and putting that not in contradiction to the national interest, but that is the national interest. I also want to just say it's not just up to governments. You know, I ended our, our statesmen, our presidents. I, I you know I ended the talk talking about our individual responsibility and living in truth. You know that we need to reclaim our moral autonomy. We need to take these issues seriously, and I think that's one of the strengths of a democracy. Our democracy is under threat, but we still are in a democracy, and that we have a responsibility to speak out on these issues. You know, to not only hold our leaders accountable. Uh, but to each other accountable and to act act accordingly. Um, individual actions can make a huge difference. Um, back in 2000, probably going on too long here, this one question, but back in 2000, uh, for example, in the Gore-Bush race, um, you know, the it was just a few hundred votes that separated the state of Florida that would have elected Al Gore. And I just want to remind Eckerd students that had every Eckerd student voted in that election, instead of just not voted, uh, that that whole election would have gone towards Gore, uh, that Eckerd College could have swung that whole election. So never underestimate uh, the power of the individual uh, to make a difference and to live in truth, as Vaclav Havel uh, said. So I'll stop there. Well, that was pretty uh, strong, uh, Bill. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the follow into this is something I think is a uh, uh, a tough question. It comes from Amanda Atkinson. You remember, remember Amanda? Amanda huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she wants to know about your thoughts on the Biden-Harris opportunity to address immigration policy as we see it unfolding right now, specifically uh, it, as we uh, see uh, unaccompanied children uh, wanting asylum, uh, DACA legislation coming at the border. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think as generally she wants to know what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, my thoughts, you know, I'm not... Um, um, uh, I'm not probably up to date exactly on the situation as of this moment. Um, my thoughts are that Biden inherited a, 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 a horrible a situation. Trump could not have made it worse. Um, and I think he's struggling uh, to sort it out. I think we have to give him, give him time. Um, I thought it was good that he appointed Kamala uh, Harris to take this on. Uh, he shows that it's, it's a priority. I also applaud his, his humanistic approach instead of a militaristic approach. Um, I think that he had his, his press conference the other day when he said uh, that he would not let these children just uh, freeze to death or starve at the border. I think that's right. The question is, how do you do that? Um, so I guess I would um, ask for patience and to give him uh, time to develop a, a humanistic foreign policy. Uh, I think he has, uh, I believe, uh, he's trying to get DACA passed and a path to immigration uh, for uh, those uh, who qualify for that program, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, Sam York wanted to ask if you're disappointed when you see figures such as Colin Powell remaining relatively significant uh, in American political culture, um, he even because even gets uh, uh, resuscitated, right, as a critic of the Trump administration, and and in Sam's words, a hero of the liberal resistance. What's your reaction to that, Professor Felice? Well, I think that Colin Powell's record is, is um, um, tragic around Iraq. He has described it himself as a black mark on his record. Um, he, the speech he gave at the UN, he would wishes he could take that back. 
and it is, um, and I think he realizes the uh, the role he played in mobilizing the public behind behind that war and mobilizing international opinion behind that war uh, was. I think he has um, he has said that's a mistake. I don't think we can judge any individual by their worst moments, um, and uh, and um, and so I perhaps give him more leeway now. I. I you know, I, I don't think he should be the spokesperson um, uh, these days on these issues. Uh, but um, you know, he his other his record in other areas has has not been um, as tainted, you could say. You know, it's hard from the outside. You know, I come down really hard on Colin Powell, right, in the book, and and I think rightfully so because of the million people that were lives lost. If you like, all the Iraqi lives and uh, that were lost in that war, it's pretty unforgivable. Uh, but it's hard on the inside, and I, I want to recognize that. You know, we see it today with um, a lot of people have asked me about uh, Deborah uh, Bricks and her situation around the pandemic uh, and uh, the bullying of her by Donald Trump, and uh, which was just disgusting. And we all saw it on on TV and how she, uh, you know, some people think, you know, well, she should have resigned. You know, she she clearly was. This was, you know. A, lies were at stake, she should have resigned, you know, and maybe she should have, uh, but I think the, the important thing was uh, for her was not to lose her voice, and we don't know. Um, I haven't done research as I did with Colin Powell, you know, maybe she um, uh, had uh, Jared Kushner's ear, I don't know, you know, maybe from the inside she really was trying to make a difference um, in, in the COVID policies that were so disastrous uh, during those that period. The important thing, uh, I think, for uh, for um, uh, people in that position, and this is where Colin Powell failed, is not to lose your voice, uh, not to lose your voice. And I, and so I applaud uh, Deborah Bricks for uh, now she is speaking out. Uh, you know, and you can say, well, she doesn't have anything to lose, but at least she's speaking out. Um, and so uh, Robert McNamara, after Vietnam, he, he 1968, he knew it was a disaster, but he never spoke out. Um, and said it was the wrong uh, policy. At least she's speaking out and saying, we should have done better, it was wrong. Uh, it was wrong uh, what we did uh, during that time, wrong what, wrong what Trump did. Um, Colin Powell to a degree has said that, he's apologized for his actions um, around the, at least the UN speech and I, I accept his words, his word on that. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the example of Deborah Burke's uh, doctor uh, here because she, she, uh, she's something to me of a tragic figure, uh, Bill. Um, you know, in the midst of this, she decided to leave Washington and go around the country trying to convince governors uh, around the country of what the right uh, policies would be. Uh, and she did, she had some success with some people um, because she felt she couldn't have any more success in Washington. Now, some might see that as some kind of an abdication or whatever, but I guess I don't now because I, I've, sometimes I feel like a doctor is a different calling and, and like Dr. Fauci, he stayed a, around as well, you know. But when I look at what happened, you know, she's going to resign her position in government now. She's giving it up because she feels she's, I guess, lost her right to hold it. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a kind of a tragedy, I think, in the midst of this. I, I, I think you're right. We shouldn't judge, you know, someone by what we think we see on TV or in, in that immediate moment. You know, another example of that um, uh, during the Vietnam War, um, General Harold Johnson, uh, he was high up in the army and he was at the Pentagon and he was hearing a speech of President Lyndon Johnson um, talking about the uh, amount of troops that were needed uh, for Vietnam. And, and Harold Johnson uh, thought that, uh, knew that Lyndon Johnson was lying. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was telling the American people right. he only needed this small amount of troops. Um, and in fact, the Pentagon had just told Lyndon Johnson they needed twice that, uh, that number of troops. And so Harold Johnson called his driver, he put on his gold stars, his, his uniform, he drove to the White House, got to the gates of the White House, and he was going to resign. And he, he'd taken off his stars. And he, at the last minute, didn't. He told the driver to turn around. He put his stars on and never confronted the president. Years later, uh, he said um, in his memoirs, it was the worst, most immoral decision he ever made in his life. He wished he had, he had lived in truth in terms of Vaclav Havel. He wished he would have confronted the president 
um, and stood up to, to him. Would it have made a difference in the war? It's unclear. Uh, but if you don't take that that stand, you 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 live in this uh, feeling that you personally failed uh, morally. Uh, but then I what I've argued tonight is that cumulatively, if we all if we all are honest, you know, with uh, with what we know is true, that can have a profound effect on on policy. There are so many wonderful questions, Bill. I don't know what to do, but here's one that I think I see several people wanting you to answer, and it comes from Devin Hero. And she says, you had us read A Life You Can Save by Peter Singer, who argued that eradicating world poverty is within our reach. The book was published in 2010. My question is, do you agree with Singer today, taking into consideration the impact of COVID and rise of nationalist leaders around the world? Do you think we're closer or further from this goal? Well, thank you, uh, uh, Devin, uh, for that uh, uh, that um, that question. Um, uh, what I what I think uh, what I would refer you to is uh, the new edition of the Global New Deal, <laughs> uh, Human Rights and Public Goods, uh, that I did with my colleague uh, Professor Diana Fugit. And what we have done in here um, is uh, it's totally updated, uh, just published uh, this year in 2021. Uh, we have updated all the data and the information on uh, uh, the right to food, the right to health, the right to water, the right to housing. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and we try to show which policy programs at the national and global level can make these rights a reality. And so uh, Peter Singer's analysis um, uh, and his hopeful approach um, uh, was, uh, is, is, I think, still valid today, at least the optimism of it is still valid today, uh, because despite um, COVID, COVID is a huge setback. Um, I think what we, it does come down to, and what we try to document here, you know, is a question of political uh, will. Let me just take the, the issue of food. I mean, there's been a, an uprise in hunger um, uh, due to COVID um, nationally and around the world. Uh, what uh, uh, the uh, what the book uh, what we try to show in here um, is that through agroecology um, that uh, there are new uh, sustainable methods uh, that have proven incredibly bountiful um, and that there's enough uh, means now to sustainably create food production so that every every human on the planet uh, can receive an adequate caloric diet um, in, on a daily daily basis. There's no reason we can't do that. It's a re, it is, like I say, political will. Nations have to make it a priority, which is linked back to the question um, about a, um, the type of foreign policy. Can we have an altruistic foreign policy? If we, have, if we had an altruistic, if our politicians were elected on the basis of the, did hunger rates go down um, during their, during their um, uh, time, time in office, and if they went up, then they're thrown out of office. Um, I think it would make a huge, a huge difference in whether these programs were implemented or not, uh, which again gets back to our responsibility to push these programs um, and to, to make sure that they then are taken uh, seriously. I think there's a common, uh, still it's, it's this um, common sense sort of feeling that the poor will always be with us. Um, um, uh, there will be constant poverty and food and famine, and that is simply not true. Uh, the other thing we out outline in the book, is we try to summarize uh, the results of the Millennium Development Goals, and then outline the new Sustainable Development Goals, and go through what the actual programs are to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. So the Millennium Development Goals were a huge success, actually, um, and they did cut global poverty by tremendous uh, uh, numbers uh, across the board. Uh, they did increase education of girls across the board. Uh, there were programs like Bolsa Familia um, in, uh, in Brazil or Oportunidades um, in Mexico uh, that actually uh, for the first time, uh, these countries that, that uh, never before uh, uh, prioritized or at least had the programs uh, that were effective uh, to, to, um, uh, to raise up education levels for, for girls and boys. Uh, to raise up uh, uh, the uh, inoculations of basic medicines for, for infants and on and on, uh, that these two programs, Opportunidades 
and Bolsa Familia were incredibly successful as part of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, so uh, for those of you that have graduated from American College and no longer studying these, uh, these uh, uh, types of efforts, I'd, I'd urge you, uh, not, don't give up hope uh, that there, there are still um, the types of programs we studied when you were here uh, that, um, that continue to give me hope um, as we move forward. There's a few more questions. There's, uh, there's, and there's one sort of general one I'd like to close with, but uh, if, you, if you still have patience and time, there are so many questions here. This one comes from a current student, Audrey Marsala, and she says, how can we institutionalize human rights in the United States that there are more roadblocks preventing new administrations from coming in and abusing human rights? How do we regain the trust of other nations when we speak about human rights on the global stage after years of declaring that we care about human rights while we abuse them domestically and abroad. I think we start practicing what we what we preach, and and um, um, I, I think we we should be honest uh, and not not ashamed or afraid to admit uh, when we have abused human rights. In terms of uh, in terms of your your question, um, uh, I think that you know when uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, uh, President Carter. Uh, had a human rights uh, policy uh, that, he, and he wasn't consistent in it. And there's, you know, there's issues of hypocrisy in the way he implemented it and all that. But overall, uh, America's image in the world really fundamentally changed. Um, and that we, we then uh, became a country people, as I said earlier, we, would want to follow. We co-opted people because we, we followed through on what, uh, what, we, uh, what we said we would do. We shouldn't, you know, in, in the US record, you know, all of us perhaps focus too much on, on the failures, but we have a positive record to build on as well. You know, when I was beating up on George Bush around the Iraq war and then the Sudan genocide and the inaction, um, uh, you know, what he did in Africa around AIDS and, and PEPFAR and then, and then uh, what, uh, what we ended up doing in uh, rescuing and providing refugee aid in, in Sudan uh, to the refugees, the million refugees that fled into Chad. You know, we were, we were the ones uh, who provided that aid. Um, and, uh, you know, at the, this, you know, when I was just so mad at George Bush, I saw this, this news report of this, um, this uh, Sudanese man and he was in exile in, in Chad and he's just crying. And he's saying, thank you, George Bush. Thank you. You, you know, you've saved my life. You saved my family's life. And, and so much goodwill got built for America uh, from that, that action. And so in the, you know, that's the type of thing I hope Biden goes back to is like being, being consistent, uh, not being hypocritical, uh, prioritizing human rights. Um, and, uh, and that can win us back, I think, our, our global standing in the world. We have got a long way to go. I think after January 6th, um, the world looks at us as, whoa, um, what is America? Uh, you know, so we've got to uh, restore our, our, um, our, our basic uh, decency um, in the eyes of so many people, but we can do that. We, we have, we have a, a negative record, but we have a strong record to, uh, to rely on as well. Okay, so the two more, I mean, I, I'm really feeling, feeling terrible about this because there's so many questions. Mia Brazine wants to know, Professor, what's your secret for staying optimistic despite how depressing the news is and how easy it is to be cynical about real change given Citizens United, gerrymandering, climate change, and the list goes on. Thank you for all your work and the amazing lecture. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I don't wake up every morning optimistic. <laughs> uh, sometimes, I mean, after, after uh, January 6th, I was, I was really bummed. I was very upset. And uh, didn't for a couple of days didn't see a, a way a way a way forward. Uh, but to be honest, you know, part of the reason I stay optimistic is because I see there are solutions. I see there is a path forward. You know, when I when I study human rights and and economic and social human rights, I think as many of you know, it's been my area. This intersection of IPE and, and international law, economics and law. Uh, when when I when I see and what I try to put in 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 human rights and public goods, when I see there's programs that can actually provide um, sanitation and water uh, to, to millions. Uh, when I read about agroecology, 
You know, when I, when I read about it, these amazing housing programs um, going on um, in areas that you wouldn't, uh, you, you wouldn't imagine in, in, in Africa and elsewhere that are, that are bringing um, basic housing uh, to people who desperately need it. When I see that there's solutions, that's what gives me hope. Um, and that's what I hope can give you hope. Uh, because it is the press uh, too often, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, right? If it's bleeding, if, if there's violence, if it's, if it's destructive, it's bad, you know, that's what we read about every morning, you know, the, uh, but you don't read about the successes. You, you don't read about, uh, about these programs that, that, uh, that I've highlighted. Um, so I guess that's a short answer to what keeps me, <laughs> keeps me optimistic, but uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> Okay, so two more. I'm holding this one la last one late because I think it's a, uh, one that you give a chance to close with. But August Dichter wants to know, Professor, what groups of rights do you believe come after solidarity rights? As we move to a more digital world, can human rights expand online? Um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, right now, it's a, it, there is a, a digital divide. Uh, so then we saw it uh, with, with COVID. Uh, that many um, uh, kids were unable to get get access to good internet service to be able to get their their remote classes uh, that were because their online their uh, real classes were canceled um, and uh, so the di digital divide is is very very real um, I guess the 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 um, um, I, I think that is going to be an area that needs needs work in terms of a drafting of of, uh, of rights for all to to this new internet internet era. Um, but it may be that the three generations of rights, in terms of especially the second generation of equity of equality, um, you know, that perhaps the rights to to the internet and rights to digital access can can fit within uh, the second generation, and perhaps that's where we can, uh, we can refine it. But I think what August's um, uh, question really shows, and what I tried to say in the lecture, is that, that human rights you know, are social constructions, and that they evolve and they grow. And as new forms of suffering emerge, new rights uh, emerge. A uh, hundred years ago, we could never say, you know, every, every child in the world has a right to a primary education, because we could, it would have been a false, a false claim. Well, we can make that claim today because we've evolved as a society, as a global society. We know how to provide um, education uh, to all, all students everywhere. We know how to do that. We know how to provide, provide clean water. Um, and so, uh, so, the, so now, since we, we can actualize that, we can make these claims to alleviate that suffering. The digital divide is the same, uh, represents the same dynamic. Um, as new forms of suffering has, has emerged with this digital divide, uh, we can then uh, devise new rights claims to alleviate the suffering that's caused by that digital divide. So here's, I think, and I'm combining two together. One, it, it starts with something from Nuong and then goes to, and I hope I'm getting this name right, Idelala's iPhone. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe you will remember, but you, you'll probably remember the person Nuong started with, where do we actually draw the line between justice and human rights? And can we always trust justice to be represented in the law? And then Idilala says, I remember like it was yesterday, sitting next to you in the ICC courtroom at The Hague, where Thomas Lubanga was tried for his use of child soldiers during the war in a Congo. Yeah. I remember asking you then, what is justice? When so many lives were lost and the child soldiers who managed to survive were just bearing their testimony and nearly a decade later with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter locally and the human rights atrocities occurring in the concentration camps further from home in Jiangjing, China, I ask again, what is justice and does the time it takes to make real global morally correct change dilute justice? <laughs> is time your enemy, Bill? <laughs> um, wow. You know, um, I think time is our enemy. I think we're in, in so many cases, um, there is no justice. You know, was the, there was no justice um, in, for the, uh, those that were slaughtered in different, the genocides of the 20th century that, that we studied in my human rights class with Samantha Power's book. Um, there, there's no justice uh, clearly um, uh, still uh, uh, for those who have been suffered being hacked and, and limbs being cut off in the Congo. Um, um, and, and you can go down, down the list uh, 
of uh, crises of the late 20th century and into the 21st century, human rights crises. And I think we could, we could uh, definitely say uh, justice has failed, that the human rights regime, uh, human rights ha regime has failed. Um, but I do, um, I do want to not end on that point uh, because I do think that uh, uh, while we have to recognize those failures, um, that the human rights framework, and, and in particular, since we're talking about justice here and global justice and the whole experiment going on at the International Criminal Court, for example, uh, which gets beat up by the United States and the US press, uh, but they're out of touch actually with what's really happening. Uh, what's really happening, at, and uh, Catherine Sink in her work, she has a beautiful book, uh, it's called The Justice Cascade. And I love that, that title, The Justice Cascading Justice. And what she shows us um, in this, this work um, is that, uh, you know, uh, we get all caught up in the Nuremberg trial and the ICC and then see failures there. And so uh, the whole justice project globally is failing. Uh, but in fact, if you go from World War II up to today and to her studies are primarily of Latin America, uh, what you see is that justice is coming from the bottom up. Um, and that you see country after country in Latin America incorporating norms to hold their leaders accountable, the basic human rights protections uh, that uh, uh, hold their, the human rights norms that apply to their citizens, to protect their citizens, um, that didn't exist before. Um, and Latin American states have, have taken, uh, taken the lead in this, and her statistical uh, presentation of this is really, really impressive. Um, and so I would um, um, urge you to look at her work, um, and uh, um, which I think gives, gives me more, more hope, and that we don't have to pit um, justice against, against human rights. I think human rights are the avenue uh, to create a more just society. Bill, uh, I think we're at your end of your evening. I can, I can uh, hear. Do you want to say one last thing to everybody well, who's I, here I, tonight? I, I do. I just, uh, for, I just really, really appreciate the turnout. Uh, we had close to 300 people um, here tonight. This is like, uh, it touches my heart. I uh, really am um, really appreciative of all the former students um, who came uh, to, to uh, listen to this uh, presentation tonight. Retiring uh, from teaching is probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, it has been my soul. It has been my, my passion, uh, my purpose. Um, but there becomes a time. There's a time. And, and unfortunately, it's a time for me. Your body, you know, there's a saying that um, 70s and new 60, or, you know, 60 years old was a new 50, and 70s and new 60. Uh, that's not true. Uh, 70 is 70. I'm 70 years old. Uh, and your body doesn't let you forget that. <laughs> And so it is, uh, it is time for me, me to retire. And I do so really having been blessed uh, with uh, these many years of decades of teaching at a great school, Eckerd College, and having great students um, who have really enriched uh, my life enormously. So I, I, I thank you and salute you. Well, and if I've never seen an evening with such an enormous number of unbelievably great questions, which says a lot about the kind of students you've had over the years, um, um, Bill, and your, your effects on everyone. I want to say I'm deeply grateful to everyone who came tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, I think all of us are moved. Um, uh, unforgettable. Thank you very, very much. Good night, everyone. <laughs>